archives of Prasar Bharti presents the timeless treasure of golden era. We welcome you to our program. Welcome to Studio One. A very warm welcome to you, Gary. Welcome to India and welcome to Studio One. I am overwhelmed to be here. Overwhelmed because I got up at five o'clock this morning, <laughs> and I'm surprised that I'm still awake. But uh, I'm very happy to be here. So. Tell me, Gary, what has it been, one, to be coming to India and um, to be coming here? What has your India experience been like? <coughs> coming to India, I've been here two days. And um, the flight from Los Angeles to Dubai is 16 hours, a two-hour layover, and then four more hours from Dubai to Delhi. Okay, take that in. <laughs> Breathe deeply, all right then? And once one gets to the Delhi airport, of course, one wants to get in the car and go straight to your destination and get some rest. Well, of course, I was held up at customs for three hours. So the experience of getting here was just a bit challenging, I might say, all right? But so far, there was a performance this morning at a school about 250 students, ages 13, 14, and 15. I had expected an audience of 8, 9, and 10. So I had to do an about face than what I was going to perform, but it went very well. You know. So uh, I feel good about that. There were a few glitches, mostly because of uh, technology, mm. <laughs> which, you know, is certainly our friend, but can stir up things in the wrong direction, which is what it did this morning at the school. But uh, it turned out okay. Yeah. So let's do a little recap and let's sort of get to understand how did this journey start? How did you get interested in the art of puppetry? You know I've told the story a million times. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but the audience hasn't heard it, so let me hometown of Chicago, USA. That was the, um, the time when there was very little television. A radio, of course, was in effect. But what one heard on the radio was not, uh, well, it's what people hear on the radio now, the music I'm referring to mostly pop music. Well, this didn't satisfy a certain audience in the city. And that audience was the audience that loved opera. Mm -hmm. They loved Puccini. They loved Aida. They loved La Boheme. They loved Madame Butterfly. And so, a very enterprising man decided that he would create an opera theater in miniature. Chicago at the time did not have a resident opera company. So anyone that loved opera, that wanted to see it also, they came to the Kungsholm Miniature Grand Opera. And this was not an entertainment for children. Children were not allowed. You had to be at least 16 years old to take a seat at the puppet opera. So the very first puppet show that I ever saw and the very first opera that I ever heard was a production of Puccini's Madame Butterfly in the original language, which was Italian. And the year was, well, I was 16 and I'm 75 now. I don't mind telling people that, all right? <laughs> but, um, from that moment, I was hypnotized by the spectacle of a wooden figure that was no more than 12 feet tall. The stage, however, was as big as this room, and this is a very large room that we're sitting in. The detail of the, uh, the scenic artist, everything was minuscule, but fitted a 12-foot character. The soundtrack, of course, was recorded, and the managers of all the 
brilliant opera stars of the day would lobby the Kung Song Puppet Opera to use their recordings. So you would hear the voice of the famous soprano uh, Ronaldo Tabalte, or you would hear Maria Callas, but you would hear that voice through a figure this tall, you know. Uh, how could a sensitive budding artist, which is what I was at the time, uh, I didn't know it, but that's, of course I was struck by the whole thing. And so I returned to the puppet opera again and again. I became an opera lover, of course, <laughs> after hearing so much opera. And exactly ten years later, I had the gall to go and apply for a job there. And so the puppet opera, uh, even though it was a difficult time in the 60s and there were not many African Americans in the world of opera in those days, they hired me. And uh, I don't know why they did, but they did. And I'm very fortunate that they did. So everything that I do now was influenced by the three and a half years that I spent at the Puppet Opera, performing twice a day, five days a week, and three times on Sunday. So it was an enormous performance schedule, and there was always an audience. The auditorium was never empty. At all. That's the story. <laughs> wow. And so from a puppet 12 feet tall to, to what 12 we inches. see. 12 inches yeah. tall to, to what we see here. So what we. We're all interested, Gary, in knowing that what is it that goes behind making these puppets? Are they made in a similar way? Are the raw materials the same? Who better than you to tell us? The puppets at the puppet opera were made in a factory. These puppets are made uh, here, all right? And I didn't really learn how to make puppets at the puppet opera because they were already made, they were already existed. But I connected with a puppet artist that worked at the puppet opera also, a grand puppet master, which I have become myself now. You know. He taught me how to make puppets. And it's an arduous task. It takes three months to make one puppet. And I work on them in groups, I, maybe ten at a time. I'm going from this one to this one to this one to this one. The first step is to is a, an act of sculpture where you have a big ball of clay and you sculpt the puppet's face, their head, their nose, their lips, their eyes. What do they look like? I'm looking at you right now. You are a wonderful puppet. <laughs> Look at your nose and, and your lips and the way your, your cheekbones are. People say, where do you get all of these faces? There are, there are almost 200 puppets. Well, the faces come from looking at a face like yours. Uh, where now your Fraser's face came from, I have no idea. It wasn't a specific face. It was a nose here and a set of eyes over there and lips some from someone else, but it all came together when I was alone at night with a piece of clay modeling the face. And the same thing with the hands, you know. Uh, imagination and comes together with reality, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure you have an entire family of puppets by now because you've been creating these for several Decades, if I may say so. Yes, you may say so. <laughs> so, do you have a favorite puppet? Uh, well, since they are not here, and when someone comes to my studio in Los Angeles and they ask that question, I say, well, step over here in the corner because I don't want the puppets to hear me admit that I do have. Of course I have favorites. Why do I have favorites? It extends to why we like Sally better than we like Rashmi. Why Henry instead of Arthur? I can't explain it. Uh, with the puppets, it has to do with their weight. It has to do with their balance. It has to do with the, the gaze that I 
that I paint in their eyes, which is the last thing that I do to make them come to life. I paint their eyes and they suddenly blink open and they're looking at me. All of those factors. If a puppet is too heavy, it's not going to get on the stage very often because it makes my arm hurt. So, therefore, you know, the puppets that are overweight, they have to get busy and do some dieting, you know, if they want to get on the stage. I'm talking to me, you think I'm crazy, but no, this is real. Lawyer Frazier is here because he's, a, he's been in the company since 1978. So longevity will, you know, contribute to becoming the favorite of the puppet master. It's like in the real theater, like in Bollywood, you know. You don't get the part unless the director really likes you. If you catch the director's eye, you might get the part. <laughs> right. I think our audience and, and I, of course, can't wait for you to have, a, have performed something for us. So why don't you Are get on to perform something now? for us? Yes, okay, yes. Right. Why don't you? I'm going to take this microphone off here and uh, let's see what we can do.
we'd let you take and catch a breath first before <laughs> we have our other set of questions because we've got so much to ask and so much to learn from you. What has the response, and we've seen the response here with, with our audience, what has the response been like amongst your other audiences, especially in the U.S.? A surprise. I think what people expect is a lot less physical than what they saw. The, the interaction that I do with my figures grows out of a, a love of dance, both modern ballet, and I have this need to be in close contact and to be crisscrossing back and forth with the figures rather than having them over there and me over here. And that, at this morning's performance, uh, the students remarked on that, that they didn't expect to see much, so much going on. It can be confusing because normally you just want to watch the puppet. But here I make it impossible for you to just watch the puppet. Uh, because of this back and forth thing that goes on all the time. And uh, I don't know what, how, if I can say much more than that, other than those that uh, are surprised are pleasantly surprised. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what we'd also want to know is, is when you make stories like these, do you make the puppet first and then weave a story around it? Or does the story come first and then basis that you make a puppet out of it? What comes first? The puppet comes first. There was a time when it was reversed, when I would write the story first and then create the puppets to fit the story. And I soon realized, as it unfolded, that that was not the way to go. Because what happens when that story goes out of the repertory? Then that very specialized puppet is suddenly without a part and doesn't have anything to do anymore. So now I just make puppets, tons of puppets. And then I write a story and then I cast the puppet. I say, well, will you work in this? Or, or, or audition puppets is what I do. That's dangerous, however, because what happens there? The same puppets get the part all the time. Just like in the real world of theater. Whoever the director loves, that's who gets the part. And so I use, even though I've got almost 200 puppets, I tend to use the same ones over and over. That's not fair. But there's no puppet union. <laughs> there's, no, there's no union, so I don't have any opposition there. But I'm aware that I need to, you know, come on, Gary. You can be a little more democratic. And this puppet is gathering dust over here for the past eight, nine years. Come on, give her a chance, you know. But then my favorite is saying... But I'm your sweetie pie, you know that. <laughs> so you're crazy? also known to have coined a very unique term, and it's also something that you founded uh, called the Yuppets in 1975. And tell us about that, about the Yuppets. That's a, that's a Hollywood name. And I created that when I moved to Los Angeles. And there's a, a downside, a sad side to that. The Black Street USA Puppet Theater was created as a, not just uh, an expression of my theatrical lust, but it was created as an affirmation of the beauty of people of color. And it is still very much needed. If It's not uncommon for a young person, black, brown, or yellow, to criticize the puppets because their skin is dark, their lips may be full, their nose may be wide. It's an issue of, 
it's so near to my heart, I, I just lose words sometimes. It's, why should a five-year-old girl feel that she's ugly because she has a wide nose? Why should a 10-year-old boy feel that he is unattractive because he does not have straight hair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that those stereotypes are very much rampant, especially in the United States of America. You know. So, I have all these beautiful black puppets. But when I got to Hollywood, to Los Angeles, I heard again and again from people in the, quote, industry, who knew about making a success, they would say, Gary, come on, man. Your puppets are beautiful, but you're not going to get anywhere unless you have some white puppets. So I said, I just shook my head. But you know what? I gave in. For a moment, I gave in. I wanted that success so badly, I gave in. So I took 12 unfinished puppets and I painted them white. And then I created a performance around those 12 white painted puppets. And at the time, in the 80s, there was a rage of the yuppies, the young urban professionals of the city that were making millions of dollars in the dot-com industry before it crashed, all right? So I decided I would name this new group of puppets the yuppets, the young urban professional puppets. And I created this performance with them. I would stand up, the music would begin, and I would drop a dollar bill on the stage. And then one by one, these painted puppets would go after the dollar bill. And they did some extraordinary shameful things to get that dollar bill. You know what the critic wrote? The critic of the Los Angeles Times in the theater section said, Gary Jones is humiliating white puppets. That's the power of puppetry. That's how seriously this man took what I was doing. <laughs> what more can I say? <laughs> puppets have power. You know? For a while, the Catholic Church, the Pope, banished puppetry. It was too powerful. Currently in Egypt, puppetry is banned. There are no puppet shows can happen in but what's the capital of, of Egypt? I can't even think of it. This happened about a month ago. Banned puppet shows? Really? You're right. There's power there. What's that running around in here? Yeah. You just recall this one incident. Tell us more about the Black Street USA Puppet Theater. Do you, do you recall any incident that makes you want to sort of, you know, take puppetry forward like that was that one incident that made you feel that look I have to do better I have to make sure that reach it reaches the masses and it reaches a wider audience like for instance with Black Street your target audience were children and you address social issues and you try to create social awareness yeah, among them yeah. children became an audience they were not my focus in the beginning children only became and they still are not my focus I want to create theater period however I am a puppet in the sense of the general public and the way they view puppetry. And they view it as entertainment, light entertainment for children. So I bow down to that literally just to make that dollar bill, okay? I would prefer not to, but that's the real world, you know, so I do that. Beyond that, the puppets can not only address those issues of self-esteem and all the other social maladies that go on currently, a story stands out. Uh, for about five years, I had worked in the um, Los Angeles juvenile justice system. There's no such thing as juvenile justice. There's no juvenile justice for a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old boy. Give me a break. Why are you going to put a 13-year-old boy behind bars far out in the desert of Los Angeles? Why? So one of the social workers persuaded me to, if I would come to visit the juvenile justice centers. And there are at least 50 of them spread across the desert, way, way outside of the city. 
These kids are literally behind bars. And when I would go to the camp to visit them with a group of puppets and walk in the room, the classroom, these are boys that have not been lucky. Poverty, sexual abuse, every horror that you can imagine. But they're behind bars. All right? So I yielded to the social worker. She said, Gary, bring them. These kids never had a childhood. Bring the puppets, please. We'll pay you. We'll, come on. All right? So I went. And I would always make part of the afternoon with the boys. I would tell them, I'm not here to entertain you. If you want to have fun and the show to go on, I'll do a little thing, but then you've got to come up here and put, take a puppet and we're going to keep the show going, all right? So at first they would hang back, they're sitting back, you know, everybody's so cool, you know, man, puppets, you know, I'm, man, this is crap. But little by little they would start volunteering. One afternoon, the session was over, and the security guards would come and get the boys. Stand up straight, turn to the left, and uh, treat them like convicts. These are 12, 13, and 15-year-old kids, and they're being treated like convicts. What's their future going to be? You tell me, all right? Marches them out of, out of the room. As they left, I turned to the teacher and I said, this was a really group, good group of boys. I said, and that kid that had Lawyer Frazier, he was phenomenal. As he had the puppet talking and cracking jokes, and she said, Gary, wow. I get emotional just, re I haven't repeated this story in years. She said, Gary, you don't understand. That kid has been here for a year and has never said one word to anybody. But with the puppet in his hand, he had a release. I'm sorry. There's, of course, so much uh, that we can learn from puppets as well. You know, I mean, for, for a child to have interacted so beautifully with a puppet, I'm sure all of us can learn so much from puppets. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about that? It's what can we learn from puppets? <laughs> I think that what someone sees when they encounter an inanimate figure, I mean, this bottle could be a puppet, you know. But what may come through this bottle must come from a base of love, must come from a base of wanting to share something, as I want to share something deep within myself with whoever may be out in front. And if you can manage to release what's in you sufficiently and project it through whatever you're holding in your hand, whether it be a tale of sadness or joy or just a tale, period, then uh, you've been successful and you'll know whether or not you've touched the audience, you know, when it's all over, you know, you'll know. So you've had so many productions, you, you, you've, you've performed in so many places, in so many countries. What I'd want to know is that Using the same medium of puppets and telling different tales to different audiences, how challenging does it become? Because the medium is more or less the same, but then there are so many stories that can be told. How challenging <coughs> is that? Most of the fables that I write uh, can be performed with an adult audience or a children's audience. Because what is to be learned, uh, you can learn it at seven, or you can learn it at 75, or you can review it at 75. Uh, it's all a, a storytelling, you know, is the universal teacher, you know, sitting around the campfire telling stories, you know. And uh, puppets existed before actors and actresses. People carved little wooden figures and told stories. And at some point, you know, along the timeline, puppets got pushed to the side and the ego of the big people emerged, you know, with all of their makeup and et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> right. 
Now, coming to your India experience, this is, of course, your second time that you've come here. We've also had a tradition of puppetry, an age-old tradition of storytelling and a form of entertainment, if I may say so. Do you feel inspired by puppets from India or from other countries for that matter? Not really. No, I really don't. <laughs> there is a national organization of puppeteers. There's an international organization of puppeteers. I'm not involved with either one. You know, um, I think that grows out of my well, you might say ego. I want what I create to be mine. Of course, nothing is new, but at the same time, I would, I don't want to feel that I was influenced by anything. My influence, artists that influence me, are dancers, jazz musicians. That's it. You know, you know. Later on during this tour, I'll be going to Pune. And there is an artist there, a Bharatanatyam dancer, that formerly lived in Los Angeles. And one of the most exciting things that I've ever done with my puppets was to accept the invitation that she extended to dance with the puppets with her Bharatanatyam dancers. And you can't imagine these puppets on a stage full of Bharatanatyam dancers, but it worked beautifully. <laughs> So I think that the second puppet sitting there feels a little left out. So before he complains, let's have another performance. We're going to do that. <laughs> All right then.
going. Wow. So now your feet's too big, I suppose. <laughs> so Gary, tell us. My God, that was one strong performance. I mean, that was also <laughs> unexpected, I think, for ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where she buys her shoes. Look at her feet. <laughs> She really does have big feet. She covers them up with her sorry, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, talking about uh, the medium of puppetry, um, like one of the ways in which the medium has sort of been extended to a wider audience has also been via films, has also been via, say, sitcoms. Here are some sitcoms that we are particularly aware of is the Sesame Street or Gully Gully Simpson as how we know it. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think somewhere then that uh, through mediums like television, films, sitcoms, we can popularize the art of puppetry? Mm, what one sees in films and television, um, except for Sesame Street. Most of the figures that you see in film or television are actually little robots. There's very little artistry involved. There are mechanical dolls that are controlled by someone sitting behind a glass window, pushing levers and doing this sort of thing. Um, I don't have a tremendous amount of respect for that, uh, but you know that's the consequence of the evolution of being able to automate everything. You can walk into a luxury hotel and there will be a grand piano in the lobby but there will be no pianist there. But the piano will be playing. And you can watch the keys going. Now, how often have I seen that? And I say, wow, how sad. How else do you think uh, can one sort of get more people to get interested in this or even start practicing it? Do you think the art of puppetry can be taught to someone or do you have to be born with that talent to be able to be a puppeteer? I think like any other uh, direction that one might take in the arts, that it first has to come from your gut, has to come from your heart, you have to have a passion for it. Uh, I would not even think about uh, teaching someone unless I recognized that they were willing to put their all and all into it. You know, if they're not willing to do that, don't, don't waste my time don't waste your time because just like a musical instrument playing the piano or the violin it's rehearsal 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 if you're not willing to do that you're you know you're kidding yourself so i don't go looking for people if they come to me and i have the feeling that they are really serious and i mean because it's a limited art form when you talk about finances can be very limited. Uh, I've been very lucky that I've been able to go as far as I have come, you know, and still pay the rent, so to say. But I know how difficult it is. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage people to do it if I didn't feel that they already had been bitten by the bug, so to say. You know? yeah. So yeah. Do, would you say that there are any challenges? Would you say there's, there's something that what, what more can be done to puppetry or for puppetry, to promote puppetry? I think that what is being done, even what I've criticized you know, as the automation of puppetry, I don't condemn it because that may be the spark that uh, pushes some young artists to go in that direction. It is uh, again, uh, it's just a toss-up. It, 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 I've met so few people that are so passionate about it. Although I know they're out there, as I said, you know, the international organization and a national organization. Um, most of those people, however, it's a passion in that it's more or less a hobby that they have a paycheck, and then they have their puppets, you know. Um, I wish them well, and uh, everyone doesn't have to take the hard road, you know, uh, to satisfy whatever impulse of creativity, you know, is there, you know. And 
maybe they just might touch on puppets just very lightly. It doesn't have to be a full out life's dedication as mine has been, you know. What comes to them may come with just one puppet. It doesn't have to be a hundred or two hundred. It could be just one character. And from that, you know, the, the inspiration could flow. It's about liberating yourself, you know, through whatever vehicle uh, touches you. In today's generation, you know, it's, it's that little thing we hold in our hand, you know. That could be a puppet also, you know. I'm working on a performance where there are going to be cell phones in the audience. And I have no idea how that's going to, but cell phones are going to be going off and kids are going to have to answer the cell phone and answer some questions, you know, from the puppets. The puppets are going to be stealing the cell phones little by little until all of a sudden <coughs> there'll be no more cell phones in the audience. And what are the kids going to do now? How are they going to conclude the story when so much is dependent on the cell phone? And That'll be an interesting thing to watch out for, <laughs> though. Sure will. I can't wait. <laughs> but talking about numbers, you seem to have a big family of puppets. So do you ever feel alone in your house when you go back? No, 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 no. Because there is, because there's so many of them, there is always work to be done in the workshop, and that's not just finishing a new figure. That is repairing. You know, making adjustments, changing a costume, uh, shampooing someone's hair. All of that stuff has to, so there's always work done. I'm never bored, you know. As soon as I get to the workshop and people, come on, I need to do this, I need this. And said, Give me a break. Let me sit down and have some coffee first, okay? <laughs> I'm never alone. This is all in my head, you know. <laughs> and do the puppets talk to you? Of course. What are you crazy? <laughs> they say, I want $5, Daddy. <laughs> I want $25. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we'd love to know if the audience has some questions for Gary. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for the brilliant stories you told us today. I was just wondering what kind of uh, relationship or how does this particular art of storytelling get affected by the digital medium, particularly the internet or related mediums? Like, what relationship does puppetry have with, with the digital medium technology? Because you did speak briefly about it uh, through the questions as well. Are you asking how the puppets can translate to the internet medium, is that what you're? I'm saying, has there been any uh, sort of difference with the coming of the internet? Maybe in terms of the audience acceptance or reaching out to f different audience, or even in the content of the particular stories that you tell through puppetry? I would consider that if I were to cross paths with someone who was more familiar with the uh, computer technology than I am. I'm sure they would have a lot of ideas in, in, along that path. And currently, I have no contact with anyone like that. But I would, certainly wouldn't turn my back on it. It would be a huge challenge for me, however, because I am more or less very set in my ways in, in what I do. But uh, just as my experience with the Abart Natyam dancer, it would be an opportunity for growth. And I would say yes to it. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much for the experiences that you've shared with us. Uh, you shared something about imagination and creativity. So my question here is, while creating any story or anything that you're creating with your puppets, so imagination comes up first and then creativity or vice versa? Is it like somebody has to imagine you have to imagine a story first and then you go ahead with the creativity or like you said that first you go into the making of the puppets and then the storyline and everything follows. So it, it, begins, it, it begins here first. Okay, it begins you. here and, and here first so and you like jot down notes and I might from those notes of course the, the script will develop but the puppets are already existing. And I will never, you know, create a specific puppet just to fit what I am writing. And as I said, because if that goes out of the repertory, that leaves that puppet with nothing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Martina asked, told you about the great tradition of puppetry which we have in India. The different states in India have different forms of puppetry. 
And uh, these are generally, usually a very, uh, traditionally families do this. Uh, puppeteers, uh, family tradition. Is it so in the uh, United States? Or how is the tradition followed there? Like, is it individuals like you, or you have a tradition of puppetry there in the US? I would, let me answer it this way. In the US, whatever one's parents is, are doing, you don't want to do it. <laughs> so, the, so the case is here now. Puppetry is losing out. Absolutely so. You know, that is, uh, for me, I consider that an unfortunate situation, but it's, it's reality in the United States that kids there want to get as far away as they can from whatever their parents are doing. That's the general rule. It's not across the board. And of course, it's not across the board when uh, fortunes are involved. Uh, you are not going to, uh, if your dad is Donald Trump, you're not going to run away to Tahiti, mm -hmm. et cetera. You're going to do whatever dad asks you to do, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, generally, American children go in the opposite direction. Are they? they find something like, um, oh, this is a great story. I want to tell a story. <laughs> uh, it's by accident, though. I, I, I'm tempted and to ask a, you another a, question. Hmm? Uh, you said that every face you come across gives you an inspiration to make, uh, fabricate, uh, uh, make a puppet sometimes, bo borrowing things from here and there, features. Hmm? Has your own president uh, ever <laughs> <laughs> given you any inspiration to draw, make a puppet? No. <laughs> I, I would not, I would not ever make a, a, a Donald Trump puppet. Me, neither did I make a Barack Obama puppet at all, no. All of the figures in, in my studio are from my imagination. And it's very often though people will look at one of the puppets and say that, oh, there is so-and-so, and they will name some, you know, movie star or something. And I'm glad when they do that, because that means that I have stimulated their imagination somewhat. Uh, uh, but no, I never make celebrity. There are a lot of celebrity puppets. If you want to see celebrity puppets, you go to Las Vegas. <laughs> they are there. You'll see an Elvis Presley puppet in Las Vegas, a lot of them. I'm not interested at all. But one last story. Okay. Can everyone hear me? This goes back, this is the story of my parents. And I, I'll, I'll try not to get emotional as I did before. This was the night before my dad's funeral. And my brother had gone upstairs to bed. And my mother and I were sitting at the dining room table. And it's around midnight. And she says, we're drinking tea. The funeral is in the morning. She says, did I ever tell you how your dad and I met? Or what happened? You go, how did he take me on the first date? And I said, no, Mom, you didn't. She said, well, he took me to the movies, to the Chicago Theater. Now, the Chicago Theater is a large Hollywood movie palace, some 4,000 seats. It looks like a palace. Well, in those days, this was around 1938, one did not just see a movie. You saw a, a live stage show first. You saw vocalists and dancers and jugglers and a live show, and then the movie came on. She said, well, I don't remember what movie we saw, but I never will forget the stage show. It was a circus, Gary. It was a circus made up of all puppets, with puppets juggling and puppet elephants. I wasn't even born yet. This was, my brother came before I did. I said, Mom, I've been a puppet artist for 15 years and you never told me this story? She said, oh, I thought I told you. <laughs> that is so, it's, it's a metaphysical kind of almost spiritual thing that happened five years before I was born, that, that puppets came into the family and manifested 
it's wild, isn't it? <laughs> I don't tell that story very often. <laughs>